I think I admire Hammett more. I admire Hammett for, for the transition that he is well, a huge part I'm of. I'm not but, saying that, but yeah. reading him to me has never been as much about language. Mm. And I think Chandler really is about language. I learned an awful lot of terms, which in this day would put you in jail or get you a lawsuit, um, which, you know, are embedded in the books because they were written in the in the context of America, you know, in the 1930s. And I remember I would truck in because I was I was a little kid when I learned to read all this stuff. I would truck in big eyed, you know, to my mother and say, "What does this word mean?" She would search for some explanation she wanted to deal with, you know. But I mean, you could really learn a lot about. Um, things that if you grew up in a in a suburb of Chicago as a protected kid, you know, that you hadn't been exposed to, and if you were lucky, you would never be exposed yeah. to. And to some degree, Burke is the same kind of thing, I think. And you're Charlie Parker, you know, it takes me places that in my life, I mean, it's really unlikely. I well, would, but it's well, not likely. I'm no, and he would want to. I mean, well, there, no, there are no. nicer places to go. Ashford right. Castle is much nicer well, than some of those places. It isn't, it isn't just physically. You know, um, it's emotionally and you know? all. And I mean, I, you know, hope I will never be as devastated as Charlie once was. But again, it's that, 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 it, that is the interesting, again, about fiction and um, and even about non-fiction crime books, which I have a very kind of ambivalent feeling towards. Um, a friend of mine runs a mystery bookstore in Dublin and uh, inside his story has a shelf of non-fiction crime stuff and it's, a lot of it tends to be sexual in right. nature. Um, and he said, you know, 90% of that he said, I sell to women. He said, men don't even look at that section. The odd guy will buy a gangster book, but he won't buy that stuff. You mean the serial killer books? Serial killer primarily? books, and the particularly ones with a sexual element in them. He hmm. says, women, women buy those books. And I, I wonder, is it that sense of, of wanting to touch something that you never want to have happen to you? Almost to... to to, to face something that you fear and that you hope you're never going to it's face in reality. It's the Carl Hyacinth thing where he said he hopes that, you know, he thinks that people read some things in part to face the alligators. Yeah, hoping that you'll true. never be in the yeah. swamp. Yeah, and but I, you get to do it at one remove and you get to exactly. kind of begin to see how, how you might respond in that That's situation. That's right. Katie James once did an event for us in which she said, you know, one of the things about reading crime fiction, you can be alone in your bed at night and hear a footstep on the stair and know it's not coming for mm -hmm. you, which I think is, you know, sort of more an M.R. James kind of image than yeah. Carl Hyacinth there, but, but very nice. Why are all your Charlie Parker books, or why are they, you know, Maine is fascinating. It's because it's a frontier state. I say that because those of us in the West do not think of Maine no. as a frontier and state. No, and I've used that, that phrase, frontier state, about Maine, and, and I think people who, who you know, come from the Western frontier feel that, that that's a, it's a misnomer, but in fact, it was a frontier. It was uh, still very is. rugged, very still is, very sparsely populated, very hard land to live on uh, once you get away from the coast. Um, you know, and facing into mountains and forest. It was it was difficult, difficult country. I, I, I worked there when I was younger and um, fell in love with it a little bit for kind of going back to something you were saying earlier where I, I find Arizona very alien and very difficult to imagine myself being here other than as a visitor. Uh, whereas with Maine, I never had that problem because Maine was sufficiently similar to where I came from in the terms of it being a, a largely a maritime state, very green, um, small villages, Stony primarily Grand. rural, yeah, parts of it very difficult to farm. Uh, all of those things I was familiar with. And then I found that, that and it has a history and, and marvelous cycles of nature that I could draw on. Uh, and then I found that no matter how strange a thing I put in my book, someone in Maine had done something odder in real life. Um, I was immensely proud of it. It was quite frequently a picture of them doing the odd thing in the paper. Um, so it's given me marvelous material. But most writers write what they read initially. And I read American fiction, not just American crime fiction, but American fiction. Um, I didn't read a lot of Irish literature because Irish literature was very inward looking when right. I was growing up and was very much about being Irish. And I'd had enough of that. I, that wasn't of any interest to me. And I was from a generation that had largely tired of that, I think. Um, and I didn't read British crime fiction. And I didn't find British fiction, apart from, you know, a select few of the great authors. Uh, I, I didn't find modern British fiction very enticing. But American fiction was full. It was like watching fireworks go off. And I thought, this is extraordinary stuff. But crime fiction in particular. And 
Irish people have never, until recently, had never really done crime fiction. No, they haven't. But you know, there's been an absolute um, explosion. Worry. There has. Yes. And, but it's interesting to kind of figure out why that is, because um, it, it says a lot about Irish society. What's happened in recent I think years? So too. Um, we a we were a very rural society for a long time. We weren't very violent, um, and the great unspoken thing was terrorism. Um, when the great boom in, in British crime writing came along in the 70s and 80s, it was the height of the terrorist problem in Ireland. You can't write a mystery novel about Mrs. Miggins getting hit over the head with an iron bar when that level of violence is going on an hour up the street from you. It overshadows everything. And crime fiction is not good at tackling issues like terrorism, particularly when it's ongoing. If you look at Spain, which is a fantastic crime writing tradition, and very politically involved, you still won't get a lot of crime novels about ETA. It's too close, and crime fiction needs distance. It needs, to go back to MacDonald, that idea of the past impacting on the present, it needs that time for that resolution to occur. And so while the terrorism was going on, you know, there were no, apart from Colin Bateman writing kind of Hyacinth-esque, Sarah right, is yeah. on the situation I mean, in Northern Ireland. Right. Absolutely, which was one way to approach it, and, and very mm -hmm. brave of him. There was no regular crime fiction being written up there. Yeah. Eugene McEldowney wrote two crime novels, one of which was set up there. O McNamee, who wouldn't consider himself a crime novelist, I don't think, wrote Resurrection Man, which was about the, the Shankill Butchers. By and large, there wasn't an indigenous growth of crime fiction. Same in the South because everything flowed into it, everything flowed from terrorism, any kind of crime that was going on in Ireland. If someone was robbing a bank, they were robbing a bank with guns they'd rented from the IRA and they were kicking back money. And, and you know, that's why I get really annoyed, and I still do, at this sentimentality that Americans, Irish Americans had for what was going on in Ireland, the great struggle. There wasn't a great struggle. There was a myth. It wasn't political, it was largely social and religious. Um, and economic. And he could, I mean, it's exactly interesting it. It how was. money has washed away. That's, that's it. That, that was the great thing, and that's what's happened. Terrorism has gone away, and we've had what the Scottish had in it, the 80s when oil money started coming in. You've got a boom. Crime changes. The nature of crime changes. It becomes closer to people making money and looking for ways to make money. And we recognize the kind of endemic corruption in Ireland, which we'd never examined before. Or um, you have your own version of the Mafia. Well, we have that as well, but we also had political corruption. We also right. had um, well, the same thing that's happened everywhere, is that we recently realized that our priests, not all of our priests, could be trusted, and that, that the church had been involved in a massive cover-up well, over a period the whole, of time. Yeah, the, the maudlin martyr. I mean, Ma the Magdalene um, martyr. Magdalene martyrs. Yeah, well, and people knew about that. I knew what was happening, but it was very hard to confront it because Irish society was very enclosed and very inward-looking. Um, and suddenly we had people who'd gone away and come back. A generation went away and came back again with a whole different set of ideas about how the world should work. They were the first immigrants to come back over the last 20 years, which had never happened before. Right. Um, and so the society was trans transformed. And it gave people an in to write crime fiction, I think, which they didn't have before. But also there was a sea change in, in the way Irish people think. Crime fiction is very rationalist by nature. Uh, there are a lot of people, if you want to look at the classic period, it's the, the birth of Sherlock Holmes and the death of Poirot. Mm -hmm. That idea that the world can be interpreted logically, that it can be understood in that way. Irish people have never thought that way. Genuinely haven't, and that's not a, a, a kind of, aren't the Irish great and very cute. There was a strong streak of anti-rationalism running through Irish thought. Even to the extent that de Valera, when he gave his great, our, our president, our first, I suppose, great president, gave a speech and he was talking about he wanted women dancing at the crossroads, the flower of Irish women would dance at the crossroads, but he paced art, a preeminence of art over science. And he stated it, and for a bedeviled Irish society for a long time. People like Ernest Walton, who was a Nobel Prize winning Irish scientist, was the exception to the rule. Irish people didn't become scientists. There was almost a distrust of that kind of rationalism. Mm -hmm. And yet and you're sort fiction. of a techie society. Well, we today, are now, yeah. but again, that was the transformation that right. occurred quite recently. But Irish people were very distrustful of it. And it may be why our genre literature for a long time was fantasy literature. And right. you could see it again in a gallery, even to the extent of Flann O'Brien cropping up in his work, so a kind of surrealism. Um, and that streak, and anti-rationalist streak has been diluted a lot, and it's been diluted by money, by people coming back, as you say, but by our transformation into quite a modern society. And, and with more urban, too, because, I mean, a lot of crime fiction is urban-based, even though you can have it anywhere. Well, Chesterton said it was about the poetry of urban life. And I think he's probably right that that's where it works best. 